the fan base is light. We're now joined by Gabe Eichert, former All-American in Oklahoma, Sirius XM Radio, Big 12 today, and he also has a great podcast, joins us. Gabe, thanks for your time. I know you just wrapped up being on the air yourself. Uh, Oklahoma, uh, the win against Texas has been now a few weeks back, and then, of course, they had the – finally, they survived at the end against UCF. What and who are they now, Texas or what we saw against UCF? You know, they're both, Smokey, and appreciate you boys having me on. But I think the last two games we've seen from the Sooners, it, it's a perfect example of the margins, right, in college football and with this team, right? If you go up, you play well, you take care of the football, you don't give up good uh, big chunk plays on defense, you run it efficiently, you throw it efficiently, then Oklahoma's a really talented team that's going to gonna win a lot of games. But in the UCF game, while they were very good on 95% of their plays that they played on defense, they gave up huge, catastrophic plays to UCF's offense. And you had some special teams issues. Right, you missed two field goals in that game. Uh, there, I would say the biggest issue in the UCF game for OU was a lack of complementary football. Meaning, the defense started the game red hot, four straight three and outs. OU forced against that UCF offense, and all they had to show was from it was a seven to nothing lead. Right, the the offense did not capitalize when the defense was playing really really well. Now, some encouraging things from the UCF game is when the offense had to put drives together, right? When they were down in the fourth quarter, they went and scored touchdowns. And Dylan Gabriel had a huge part in that. The run game got going a little bit. But, yeah, I think Oklahoma is a team that is capable of beating anyone in the country on their best day. And if they don't, and if they don't play well, they're capable of losing to dang near everyone here in the Big 12 Conference. Like, that's just the kind of team that they have this season. But so far, so good for the Sooners. 7-0 and feels pretty dang good. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it, it's as good as it gets, especially with the win against Texas, Paul. Gabe, were you surprised uh, that they were not able to run uh, as much at will on, on UCF, especially late in that game, considering UCF's massive struggles stopping the run this year? Yeah, it, I was not. I was not surprised. I was maybe more disappointed than anything. I was hopeful that OU's issue when it comes to running the football, they have actually run it efficiently. I, I don't know if you guys are big analytics guys, but there's a there's a metric out there that is. That, that measures success rate when you're running the football. And OU, according to Bill Conley's SP Plus stats, they've got a 50% success rate running the football, which, which has them checking in as the 22nd best rushing team in the country. Right? Which is good, right? You're a top 25 rushing team in the country. The issue they have, guys, is there are seemingly no explosive runs for Oklahoma. Right? You think about a run game, like you get three, you get four, you get five, you get 40. OU has very few of those chunk runs. And in fact, going back to the analytics thing, while they're 22nd in rushing success rate, they are 119th in the country in rushing marginal explosiveness. Basically, how it, depending on situation, how are you producing explosive runs? It's been an issue. It continues to be an issue for Oklahoma. So they've run it okay. They just haven't produced large, you know, momentum shifting plays with their running game, and. Uh, they're continuing to search for ways to find that. I think it's been a combination of the offensive line, and also they just have not had—they have not had dynamic playmaking 
at the running back position. They've had solid play, but they haven't had anyone that has done a really good job of making free hitters miss, you know, juking a guy, spinning out of things. They have not had a guy emerge and show that he's capable of that. So the running game, it's not awful. Should it have been better against UCF? I, I absolutely absolutely believe it should. But what they need to find is more explosive runs. Gabe, what were your thoughts on the Knights and just seeing them up close? Uh, obviously, it's been a, a big transition and, and a mighty struggle for them so far. And, and they had, you know, possibly this colossal win right there on their fingertips. But alas, they, they wait for that first Big 12 win. What, what do you like and what do you not like right now about the state of uh, Gus Malzahn's team? Well, I am I'm a fan of Gus Malzahn. Uh, going back back in the day, guys, I'm getting old. Uh, <laughs> Gus Malzahn recruited me when he was the offensive coordinator at Tulsa. Oof. He called me in back in 08. And Charles Clay, who I ended up being teammates with in Buffalo, actually, he said Charles Clay just caught a ton of balls, you know, throughout his career at Tulsa. He said, if you come to Tulsa, uh, you'll catch more passes than any other tight end in the country. And I said, damn, that that sounds pretty good, coach. <laughs> yeah. He left for Auburn and took the OC <laughs> job like five days after that conversation. <laughs> but he he's doing a good job. He's a creative mind. I think he's he's assembled a good staff. Um, they've gotten the school to invest in the program. They're doing a lot of good things on the NIL side of things. But as far as their team, it's a good group. It's a good group. I think the, I think the offense is, is a little more talented than the defense. I, I was impressed with John Rice Plumley and the way he played, even though he's clearly still not a hundred percent to me. Uh, I thought he, I thought he played a, a really nice game. They've got, they've got some guys at the skill spots. I think R.J. Harvey is one of the best backs in the Big 12, and, and I think Javon Baker is – I mean, he's one of the most talented wide receivers I've seen this season in the Big 12, and he had a big day against the Sooners. But the, the defense for UCF, I think the strength of the defense is in the secondary – so when they play teams that, you know, really run it efficiently, that have good offensive line, I don't think there's a bunch of, you know, top end talent along the defensive front there for the night. So I, I think it's going to be up and down for them. You know, they have not won a conference game so far. I I would bet they're going to win one against Cincinnati or Houston. They still have both those teams left on the schedule. But yeah, it's going to be it's going to take some time, right, for them to build at the line of scrimmage and for Guess Malzahn to, to continue to develop that program. They are just a, they're they're playing a they're just in playing a new kind of grind now in the Big 12. Uh, they're playing against a bunch of teams that have been, you know, recruiting to the Big 12 when they haven't had that ability and I've got faith in Malzahn if he stays there long enough to to build that thing up they're always going to have speed at the skill positions being down there in the state of florida but what they need is better guys at the line of scrimmage and then they got to have they got to continue to recruit recruit and have a difference making player at the quarterback spot in my opinion yeah they need more gay bikers on the offensive line i i don't know their offensive line uh, it, it's not a bad group, right? Uh, I mean, it's it's not a bad group. Now they're a little undersized at a couple spots, especially at center. But overall, you know, they they battle. They're good, but you're th- there's no doubt they need to get they need to get deeper along the offensive line. They've had some injuries. They've had to plug some guys in. There's a bit of a drop off there, and, and that, I think that'll come. Right now that they are recruiting to a Power 5 conference, uh, I think that'll come, and I, I would assume they'll attack the transfer portal as well. But, yeah, they are – they're having a rough of it in year one, and that's, that's what I expected from them. Uh, going back and looking, I know a lot of people thought that they were going to have the best chance of any 
uh, any of the newcomers this year. Uh, I picked UCF to go five and seven before the season. So I, I think that's where they end up landing. So I, I think I think there's some positive things to take away from how they've played in this first season in the Big 12, but there's there's undoubtedly work to be done there. Malik Murphy starts this week for Texas, Gabe. Uh, oh boy! <laughs> yeah, and look, there is you know plenty. If you're a Texas fan, there's plenty of reason to be excited to see him play a, a full game, given the talent that he has. But he has not played against someone in another jersey for very long in any game. What is the biggest challenge for Steve Sarkeesian to make sure that Malik Murphy does not get uh, does not see ghosts for the rest of his time as the Texas quarterback? Because those first couple starts sometimes can make or break guys. Right, and if if you saw him go in in the Houston game, I mean the guy was he was jacked up. Right, you could tell the blood was pumping. He was he was feeling it a little bit, and I, I think the the biggest challenge for Malik Murphy is just going out there and just doing your job. Right, you don't have to do any more than that. Right, you don't have to go out there and try to beat Quinn Ewers. You have to go out there, trust your preparation, and do your job. Right. And you got to do that knowing everyone in the country is watching to see if you're any good or not. I do think it's funny. (laughs) I've seen a lot of Texas fans. They're like, he was awesome in the spring game. We're not worried at all. It's like, it's the damn spring game. What are you talking about? It doesn't, it does not matter. Right. It is not the same as going and playing those grown men from BYU. But, and, and this is something that the leaders in that locker room need to get across to Malik Murphy. It's not all about him, right? It, football is the ultimate team game, right? He doesn't need to do any more than what he's supposed to do out there. And it's up to those guys around him, the guys on that offense. they got a lot of experience and a lot of talent on that offense. Right? It's up to everyone else on that team to play well and to make Malik Murphy's life easy on Saturday, right? That wide receiver core. Step up. That offensive line has been a little up and down, in my opinion. Make life easy on Malik Murphy. Now, I am interested to see how much Steve Sarkeesian puts on his plate when it comes to the RPO stuff. Because despite some of Quinn Ewers' flaws, he was pretty efficient in knowing, hey, when to hand the run off, when to take the RPO stuff on the outside, when to pull the run out of the out of the running back's belly, throw the slant in behind the linebackers. He was he was a good decision maker for the most part in those situations. And that's a big part of what Texas wants to do offensively. How efficiently does Malik Murphy operate in those situations? I think that's that's definitely something I'm interested in seeing. And I, I think he's going to be fine because – I think they're just going to hand the ball to Jonathan Brooks and C.J. Baxter a lot. BYU is not good mm-hmm. at stopping the run. They're also not good at running the football. So uh, I think that Texas is going to – they're going to have a big talent advantage in that game. I don't think Malik Murphy is going to have to do anything superhuman. It's not a game. I think that he's going to have to win – you know, throwing the ball all over the yard. I think they're going to be able to run it really efficiently and, and lean on that run game. But, yeah, I am very, very intrigued to watch Malik Murphy on Saturday. And it seems like a lot of people would be even more intrigued if he struggles. <laughs> and then uh, people want to see what Steve Sarkeesian would do if he does struggle. But I, th- I think he's going to be just fine. Gabe, I mean, it sure seems like the odds favor uh, a rematch being the collision course for the Big 12 title game, but there are some interesting contenders outside of those those top two that will soon be leaving. Uh, which intrigues you more? What's going on in Ames? What's going on in Manhattan with the quarterback situation and how that's provided a spark? Or what's going on in Stillwater with uh, the Cowboys and Mike Gundy? Man, it is interesting. You are You are correct. It, it is crazy when you think about what we were saying about Iowa State after they lost to Ohio and then what we were saying about Oklahoma State 
after they got, I mean, played off their own field against South Alabama just about a you know a little over a month ago. Both teams are are pr- are playing some really good football. So I I think out of all the teams right now, because there's definitely a conversation going on about okay, who is the third best team in the Big Twelve? If if I had to pick it right now, and I know that it's it's silly because K State just played in Stillwater a couple weeks ago and went and lost, mm-hmm. but I still think K State's the third best team in the Big Twelve, and I think that the two quarterback system, while you know we've been told forever that if you've got two, you don't have one, it's it's working pretty dang well for Chris Kleiman uh, there in the Wildcats. And I've been impressed with the way that Will Howard has handled it. I've been impressed with what I've seen from Avery Johnson. That is a that is a talented young QB that the Wildcats have. But I'm also impressed just how the team has handled it. I, I think that both of those guys are very well liked in that locker room, and that has resulted in kind of this jolt of energy for that program. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what it looks like for the the rest of the way for Kansas State, but, you know, they still have Texas on the schedule, and then they get Iowa State the last game of the season, and who knows? I mean, that could be that could be a game that has massive implications. Uh, Oklahoma State is interesting, though, because, and this is something I was talking about on Big 12 today, earlier today, guys. You look across the country right now, and you start having a conversation. You start a conversation about non quarterbacks that could be in the Heisman Trophy picture. And the first two running backs that I think are in the conversation are Jonathan Brooks at Texas and Ollie Gordon at Oklahoma State. Ollie Gordon has been an absolute monster for Oklahoma State, and he's doing it behind, I believe, a very average offensive line. For the Cowboys, Alan Bowman's making really good decisions with the football. His accuracy's been really good, but but you look at Ollie Gordon, what two eighty two and four touchdowns mm-hmm. against West Virginia last week. I mean, he has just been an absolute monster for the Cowboys. So I've been I've been really impressed with them. I just I still have some question marks about Oklahoma State's defense and just kind of where they're at in that new system under Brian Nardo. Gabe, as always, appreciate your time and the knowledge, insight, experience, man. Have a great day. Thanks for your time. Hey, you guys. They're down there in Waco, boys. It'll all be okay. (laughs) We'll we'll figure it out week to week if it will be. Thank you, buddy. Gabe Eichert from Big 12 Network, Sirius XM, former all-American at Oklahoma. This is 365 Sports.